who's hiding. Hi, everybody. I'm Martha Burtis. Welcome to 15 and 15 with the CoLab. Today's session is on ChatGPT, a 15 minute intro, which um, anybody who knows anything about ChatGPT or AI knows that's not even remotely feasible to do in 15 minutes. But I'm going to do my best. And at the end, I'm going to share some additional resources where you can explore more. So to go ahead and jump in, um, for those of you who really uh, maybe haven't been paying much attention to all the developments in AI, what exactly is ChatGPT? Um, it is a system that was launched about a year ago in November of 2022 by a company called OpenAI. Um, and the technology, I'm gonna be really quick about this and I'm gonna preface it by saying, I am not an expert in artificial intelligence technology, but I will do a very quick job of trying to summarize sort of what's under the hood with a tool like ChatGPT. So um, it is often referred to as a um, large, you'll hear people talk about it as a large, large language model, which means that it's based on this enormous data set of language and information that OpenAI has sort of fed to the system. Um, it then uses uh, what we call um, deep machine learning to understand how language functions, how words, ideas are related to each other through language. It also has a, what we call a deep neural network, which provides almost a brain-like infrastructure for the tool to connect um, nodes of information and understand how information is related. And then finally, it uses what's called a, transfer, a transformer model which helps it to learn and understand context so that um, the, the responses that it gives you are hopefully contextually informed. Um, but the TLDR of all that is basically, it's a tool that when you give it instructions, um, it can do a whole lot of things. Um, specifically, what we tend to focus on is that it can, it can write responses, it can edit text, it can help brainstorm or summarize, um, and it also is capable of doing some translation. Um, there are other tools out there, obviously AI tools that use similar technologies to do some of the same and some different things. There are tools, Google and, and Microsoft both have sort of chat GPT-ish tools. Um, there is a tool called Dolly, which will generate images based on prompts. It, I believe it has just been incorporated into chat GPT in the last few weeks. Um, there's a tool called Whisper, which does speech to text. Um, automation, um, and there's a tool called Runway, which can do automated image editing. So there's all different kinds of artificial intelligence tools out there right now um, that allow you to, to um, manipulate and create um, information. There are some limitations to chat GPT. One of the things that is um, talked about when there are critiques of it is that it suffers from what are called hallucinations, which means it just makes stuff up. Um, that sounds really, really, really believable. Um, it also is dated, so it, the data set has a, an end date, um, and you can't get any information out of it beyond that uh, end date of the data set. And then it literally has technical limitations. So theoretically, you could give it a prompt that just is too much for its memory. I, I have not done that, but maybe that's because my prompts aren't smart enough. Um, so when we talk about chat GPT and what it means for us as educators, very often one of the responses people have is that they want to what I'm calling teach against chat GPT. So basically they do not want to have students be using AI or tools like chat GPT in the classroom. So what does that look like? Um, one of the approaches that people might take is restricting or forbidding use of AI tools. So that may mean language in your syllabus and really clear language, um, cl clear conversations with students that this is not allowed. Um, that means that you have to have those policies in place. You have to have consequences in place um, and more than likely, it also means you have to move on to this practice, which is using some kind of tool to detect AI usage. Um, that's a, um, a complicated um, proposition. Um, there is a little bit of debate um, from companies that provide this sort of um, this sort of service of just how much prevalence they're seeing of AI in student submissions. So, for example. Um, I think Turnitin, which is one of the big companies that you know you can you can put student work into in order to detect plagiarism and now also to detect um, AI, um, they say that out of 3.5 million submissions that they've processed for AI writing, this was over the summer, I believe, 
um, 9.6% had over 20% of AI writing and 3.5% had between 80 and 100% of AI writing, which is actually a kind of small percentage, which makes you wonder, A, like, is this problem more overblown than we think, or is the tool really not doing a, that great of a job of detecting? Um, and in fact, um, the results of, of this are kind of inconsistent. So in a statement from Turnitin, um, they admitted that like in a laboratory setting, they have a laboratory where they test this, they get very good results in terms of being able to detect AI. But then what they hear about from practitioners out in the real world is that maybe it's not so great. And in particular, one of the big concerns here is if you're going to rely on another tool to detect AI, there's absolutely incidences of false positives where you might run into a situation of accusing stu a student of having um, falsely created this content using AI or plagiarizing this content using AI, and it turns out that's not true. So the bottom line is that this whole approach of forbidding it via policy and then trying to use tools to find and unearth um, these practices is pretty fraught and pretty difficult and may get you into a situation where you have a really strong policy, but you don't really have a way to enforce it and feel comfortable doing that. Um, the other approach that I think is far more fruitful, it involves changing assignments so that it's actually harder to use AI to do the work. Um, so the kinds of assignments that might involve are instead of, you know, having students just do writing in assignments outside of class that they turn in, doing in-class writing, there are some faculty, I don't necessarily buy into this, but maybe you do, who are requiring students now to hand write their work because I guess they assume that like, they're less likely to take something from an AI tool and handwrite it. I don't know, maybe that's handwritten in class as well. So you can be sure they're not like pulling out their phone. Um, I'm not sure handwriting actually provides a whole lot of protection. More importantly, maybe approaches like project-based learning, which we have lots of um, information and resources about that in the collab. Doing things like process reflections, where in addition to having a student turn in work, you have them reflect upon the process of doing the work. Um, and eliminating those assignments that are truly like just a check for understanding where it's dead simple to use, not even just AI, but a search, a plain old Google search to find the answers, thinking about uh, uh, making our assignments um, get at a different kind of understanding and knowledge from our students. Um, some faculty, instead of teaching against ChatGPT, are really thinking about how to teach with ChatGPT. So they may have assignments that actually require students to use the tool. Um, for example, to do brainstorming and, and initial ideation or idea generation using a tool like ChatGPT. They may allow usage with certain guidelines. For example, they, they require students to let them know how they used the tool or to cite the tool. Um, they may have AI, you may have an assignment where you use AI for initial drafts and then students do revision upon that as a way to think about the writing process or where um, AI editing, you, they're looking, they're comparing sort of like what happens when I edit this piece versus when I ask ChatGPT to edit it and what are the differences there? What am I noticing in terms of my eye versus ChatGPT, uh, ChatGPT's eye? Um, and finally, the last one that I have on here is analysis of um, AI generated content as a way to discuss expertise and accuracy. This might be particularly useful within a disciplinary context. So like, what does ChatGPT actually know about this discipline or this field? Where does it get it right? Where does it get it wrong? Using that as a, spring, a springboard for additional conversation about how knowledge is created and, and shared. Um, and then finally, I really, really believe that this one is important, which is not, it's not just about teaching against it or with it, it's about teaching it. So I believe we have a responsibility to help our students understand what these tools are and how they work. Um, one of those responsibilities is that they are going to probably get jobs in a world where AI exists in some form or fashion, potentially in their own workplace. And so they need to be prepared for that. Um, but I also think it's about teaching AI with a critical lens. So that involves doing things like exploring bias that we often see in AI. Um, these tools may tend to center certain privileged viewpoints. It may involve um, really delving into misinformation and inaccuracy. But as I said, AI is absolutely known for making stuff up. So talking about where does that misinformation come from? And relatedly, 
um, thinking about this question of is AI, when, when there is misinformation, is that a reflection of the real world because these tools are, are getting their information from real data or is it the tool that's intervening and creating the misinformation? So there's a real interesting conversation there to be had about where that inaccuracy is coming from. There's also a really important conversation to be had about the human labor of AI, the people whose job it is to train AI, um, having students do research about this, um, the, the, the um, giveaway on all of this is that it in often involves rather poor people in poor countries who are asked to review content that can be pretty toxic and awful in order to well, take out of the data set those things that they don't want in it. Um, so there's a real ethical question involved in the use of AI, as well as the ethics of intellectual property, that uh, a tool like ChatGPT is using other people's intellectual property in order to generate these responses, and privacy and data, like what happens to our information when we put it into a tool like this, and is our own information and data being used to train a tool like this. So this aspect of teaching the tool, I think is very important for us to be thinking about in higher education as we prepare our students. A couple of reality checks that I just wanna mention here. Um, one of which, which is kind of interesting is a study that's coming out, um, I think in science, magazine at some point this fall that basically scientists at Stanford have done a, a study that reveals that ChatGPT is getting dumber. The answers are not as good now as they were six months ago. Another reality check to keep in mind is that bad AI writing is just still bad writing. So like if you talk to people who teach writing and have seen students turn in ChatGPT-ified assignments, they're pretty easy to recognize. Um, and finally, I think it's really important to balance the ethic of this. Like when we use it, are we comfortable with these ethical dilemmas um, being part of the conversation, making critical choices about when we use it and how we use it um, and balancing the need um, versus the harm that it might could or co could cause or create. Um, so some next steps and resources that I just wanna point to, one of which is that in November, um, uh, the Lamps and Learning Commons, Commons is going to be running a week-long um, challenge, AI challenge that anybody can kind of play along with. So put it on your calendar, November 13th through 17th. We'll have more information in the coming weeks. We're also working on a design forward module that should be available um, winter of 2023, maybe spring of 24. We're trying to decide exactly how we're going to make that available that will focus on AI. And finally, I wanna share this and spend a few minutes showing you this. This is um, a featured resource category on artificial intelligence on our website. That is the URL for it if you're interested, bit.ly slash Colab AI. And please note that with bit.ly links, capitalization matters. So Colab is all undercase um, AI uppercase. And I'm just gonna jump over here now and show you, this is um, our resource page, our resources page on the Colab website, we've spent the summer doing something a little bit different. We created some featured um, categories that go a little bit deeper. Um, we realized we had a lot of stuff on our resources page and we wanted a way to really highlight some of these really special topics um, where we had quite a bit and where we felt like there were other things we could bring in um, to point people to. So for example, this is the artificial intelligence one. Um, these are all live now, these featured categories. So I invite you to explore them. Um, so in addition to a little bit of introduction, we've pointed to some featured resources related to PSU and in this case, USNH. This includes um, the academic integrity policy that now has a little bit of a blurb about the use of artificial, in artificial intelligence. USNH, uh, ETNS also passed an AI standard about the use of AI for university business. Um, so that's kind of an interesting read if you're interested in how the system is using AI um, and their concerns about ethics. On the left-hand side here are the resources that we've developed in the collab related to AI. And then I've also curated some videos. Some of these are our videos, but some of them are videos from elsewhere as well. Um, a couple are from um, Brian Alexander, a colleague of ours who does um, weekly, uh, video talks with folks about various topics related to higher ed. There are a few about AI. And then another colleague of ours, Autumn Keynes, who has been a fantastic voice about the ethical use of AI. So we've featured some of those. And then finally, a pretty extensive reading list that we've put together. Um, 
everything from what the heck is ChatGPT to um, why you sh how you could use this in the classroom to again, some of these ethical um, quandaries and dilemmas that you might be facing. So that was actually 15 minutes and I'm gonna go ahead and stop this recording. I have um, a few minutes to hang out if anybody has any questions. Um, let me.